Um, I'm going to let our reading authors introduce themselves as well as the book that they will be reading from. Um, and we're going to just keep it simple and go in alphabetical order. That means first up, we have the lovely Chris Bryant. Chris, I hand things over to you. Uh, I will be reading from my holiday romance home that's out now. Um, and this is a, it's kind of a sweet um, romance, low angst, and just kind of a feel good, get us in a good mood for the upcoming holidays. And the scene I'm going to read from is um, my sheriff. There's a sheriff, Natalie Strand. She's sheriff of Spruce Mountain, Oregon, which is a very small town. And uh, she moves back after her father uh, is diagnosed with cancer. She moves back and she ends up becoming sheriff of the town. And her crush from high school uh, uh, returns after 17 years of being gone. So they have had a few outings together, um, not quite dates, but sort of. And I'm gonna pick up the scene where they are discussing um, Natalie's uh, past romances. She opened up about the complicated relationship and a few others that made Sarah angry at how the previous girlfriends had treated Natalie. She sounded bitchy or she wanted too much from you. Alternated after every ex-girlfriend story, a total of six was revealed to Sarah. It's gotta be me. I'm the common denominator. I'm just not somebody women date. Her tone didn't su suggest she was asking for pity and she didn't make excuses. Natalie hadn't given up, she just stopped looking. That gave Sarah hope. She couldn't deny that she was attracted to her. I doubt that. You're perfect and your person is out there. I just know it. It was so quiet after she spoke. For a flash, she, shot, she thought she had gone too far. Maybe she revealed too much about what she wanted or touched on what Natalie needed. And as much as I hate to say this, I think I should probably go. We both have an early start to our, to our day. Mine just happens to be in the form of a highly energetic child who will no doubt wake me up in six hours. Sarah looked at her watch and stood. Ah, the proverbial turning into a pumpkin at midnight. Okay, Cinderella, I'll see you in the morning. Sarah sighed when Natalie took her hand and gently led her to the front door. Ghost Dog followed, nudging his nose against Sarah's hand until she stopped and said goodbye to him. I won't see you tomorrow, but I'll see you soon, hopefully on a leash with Sheriff Natalie. She stood and slipped into her jacket that Natalie held open for her. Drive carefully. The crazies are out at midnight. Natalie was so close to her. A calm washed over Sarah as she pulled Natalie into a warm, more than friends hug. She knew what she was going to do. Instead of stressing and overthinking it, she did what she did 17 years ago and what she should have done a week ago and last night. Instead of breaking apart after their goodnight hug, she kept her face close to Natalie's and did what she had been dreaming of doing again for so long. She kissed her. Natalie lost all concept of time when she felt Sarah's lips press against hers, softly at first. Her memory took her back to the first perfect kiss, and for a moment she thought she was at Ellie's party, except the woman kissing her now was bold and not fueled by cheap alcohol. This woman knew exactly how to kiss. Sarah's warm body, with all of her delicious curves, brought her back to the present. They were really kissing. Slowing down or breaking apart wasn't even an option. Natalie was trying to figure out how to get closer, even though their bodies were flush. She slipped her hands inside Sarah's coat and ran her fingers along the hem of her sweater, slipping them underneath to stroke the soft skin of her lower back. They both moaned at the contact. There was a moment she had, this was the moment she had dreamed of for so many years and it was worth the wait. She sucked Sarah's bottom lip into her mouth and slipped her tongue inside when Sarah parted her lips. It was heavenly. Just when she didn't think their first kiss could be topped, they perfected it. When she felt Sarah tremble in her arms, Natalie pulled away. She took a deep breath and rested her forehead against Sarah's. That just happened, right? She felt Sarah pull away too, only to look into her eyes and nod. Wow, yes, that just happened. She was breathless and sexy as hell. And we were in my house, not Ellie's, right? Natalie turned her head and saw a ghost dog a few feet away. Yes, my house, because there's a dog. Sarah's arms circled her waist and warm lips pressed against her collarbone. She closed her eyes and tilted her head up to afford Sarah more room. When was the last time she felt this much all at once? Passion, need, want, desire, and wetness. The throbbing between her legs was instantaneous, all from a kiss. Definitely not at Ellie's house. Sarah took a step back and let out a deep breath. Okay, I really need to go. Natalie couldn't let her go. Not now, not after waiting and wanting for so long. 
She pulled Sarah back into her arms. Not yet. She kissed her again, hungry for her taste. It was as if nothing had changed, but everything was a million times better. She moaned when Sarah threaded her fingers through her hair and pressed up against her again. It took everything she had to keep from lifting Sarah into her arms, wrapping her legs around her waist and carrying her back to the bedroom to do everything she had fantasized about for years. She slowed the kiss until it was a gentle brush of her lips over Sarah's. Okay, okay, you have to go. I know. Sarah let out a shaky laugh. I hate that I do, but it's probably for the best. Here, I'll walk you to your car. Natalie grabbed her coat, but stopped when she felt Sarah's hand on her arm. I need to separate right now because we both, before we both do something crazy. Plus I need to get home to Harley. Not that she had anything against Sarah's daughter, but mentioning her gave Natalie, gave Natalie pause. You're right, I'll see you tomorrow morning. Try to get some sleep. She placed a soft kiss on Sarah's slightly swollen lips. Good night, definitely good night. That was fantastic, love a kiss scene. Thank you. Such a nice little tease about what's going on based on the chat roll where uh, the readers of the audience oh. uh, is enjoying that immensely. A little hot and hot face. So um, that is fantastic. I'm Something tells me we're not going to get a kiss in Eden's reading if she is in fact reading from her current no, no. Uh, <laughs> but you're going to be incredibly British while you read. So even if it's scary, I'm on board, even though I don't like scary things. You're the one who could, if you read all your books to me, I'd be great. Like, get over it. Anyway, sorry. Let me introduce Eden Deer, reader, and she's going to be reading from her, I believe, current release, Z Town. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll try and be as British as possible when I read it for you. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's from my new one, Z Town, um, which is out, was out on the 1st of October with Bowl Strikes, and it'll be out on the 13th of October with everybody else. So, this book is about Provincetown um, and, and a zombie outbreak um, in Provincetown. So the bit I'm going to be reading um, from is probably about a third into the book um, when it's all starting to kick off with the zombies. Um, we have Lane, who's flown over from the UK to try and win back Meg, who lives in Provincetown. Um, and she's probably got a bit more than she bargained for um, in terms of what, what's starting to happen in P-Town. Meg stepped out onto the street. It was after nine, but the town was dead. Between the cold going around and the weather, she guessed the tourists had headed further along the Cape. She couldn't blame them. 68 and sunny and well fleet, while Provincetown struggled along in perpetual gloom. It didn't help her or the other businesses that relied on the tourist trade, though she couldn't lie and say a quiet shift at the squealing pig wouldn't be welcome. Today was supposed to be a day off, but with almost everyone out sick, she had to go in. Her boss still hadn't returned Meg's calls and she was starting to worry. She plans ahead to the library to see the exhibition, then call in on her boss and Joanne. Meg started walking down commercial. It was too early for most stores to be open, but even so, it was still too quiet. And when you coupled the silence with the dark skies, Meg was kind of creeped out. She walked a little faster. Somewhere behind her, she heard a scream. Meg almost jumped out of her skin. What was that? It didn't sound like someone falling around. The scream sounded real. Meg looked around her at the darkened stores and even darker alleyways beside them. She stared into the gloom of the alleyway beside the wide puppy. She squinted, strained her eyes. It looked like someone was standing back there. Hello, Meg called out. No answer. Meg pulled her jacket tighter around her. Hello, is anyone there? Still no answer. Someone was definitely there. She could make out legs and arms and the shape of her head. Someone around her own height, maybe a woman. The figure groaned, it shuffled forward. That was enough for Meg and she bolted. She pumped her legs and tucked her arms and sprinted up the street. She was completely overcome by an irrational terror she didn't understand, but her gut was screaming run and her legs obeyed as though Meg really didn't have a say at all in the matter. By the time she reached the Provincetown, Provincetown Public Library, Meg was blowing hard. She stood by the side entrance, bent forward at the waist and gasping for air. What the hell was that back there? Who was that weirdo in the alley and why'd she run away like that? Why had Meg been so scared? Meg, Meg, are you okay? Wendy Moon walked through the library doors and put a hand on Meg's back. Honey, what happened? Something back there, Meg gulped in air. Something was back there, where? Wendy looked over her and down the street. I didn't see anything. Meg, Meg shook her head. Her breath was starting to come back and she stood upright. 
I'm sorry, Wendy, I got a little spooked. Someone was standing in the alley at the wide puppy. I think they were trying to scare me, arsehole. Who would do something like that? Are you sure someone was there? It's pretty overcast at the moment. Maybe you imagined it. No, they were there. They groaned and did this zombie type shuffle towards me. I think they were falling around. That's what it had been, hadn't it? Some idiot kid trying to scare her. Well, they got a good. Meg didn't think she'd ever run so fast or so far in her life. If she ever found out who'd done it, she'd kick their ass. We'll come inside and have a glass of water. You're here for the exhibition, right? I've been really looking forward to showing it to you. Unfortunately, something terrible has happened. Meg followed Wendy inside, but her mind was still on the alley. It was a scream. That's what set her off. Usually she'd have gone right into that alleyway and given the kid hiding there a mouthful. And she was almost certain now it had been kids falling around. She guessed Provincetown could be boring if you were a teenager, but that was no excuse to hide in an alley scaring people. Meg followed Wendy into the main part of the library with tons of books lined shelves. She'd always liked this place. She remembered the first time she'd come here and gone up to the second floor. She'd been stunned and delighted to see a full-sized boat right in the middle of the room. Its masts re reached right to the ceiling. It looked like it was ready to sail right on out of there. Meg realised Wendy was talking to her. Sorry, Wendy, what did you say? Just as Wendy turned to repeat it, the lights went out. Someone screamed. Lane held the vase like she was the last up to bat the last over and it was for the ashes. She held the vase by the neck down by her leg and she edged around the door frame and poked her head in the kitchen just long enough to see no one lurked there. The room was a mess though, chairs overturned and crockery smashed to pieces on the floor. Lane stepped into the doorway proper and nearly slipped on a pastry that had been trampled into the lino. The kitchen was a slaughter house. There was blood up the walls and a large wet pool of it glistening in the light and, um, and, and covered half the floor. Lying in the centre of the pool was Ella, her arms were up by her sides and her mouth hung open. Sightless, partially hooded, stared at Lane. She was definitely dead. Even if it hadn't been obvious from her face, something had been in her stomach. She was torn open from breast to pelvis and the stink was almost unbearable. Lane forced herself further into the kitchen. She had to make certain nothing was still in here before she checked the rest of the bed and breakfast. Ella told her yesterday there were four other guests. Excluding the one who now lay dead upstairs, that left two other people. Lane thought they must have heard the screams like she had, but you never knew. They might still be tucked up in bed. Lane just hoped it was somebody else's bed. Suddenly Ella twitched. At first Lane thought it was her imagination. Then Ella did it again. The whole body convulsion, a whole body convulsion followed and Lane ran to her. Ella, Ella, can you hear me? Lane knelt by her side. How was this possible? She didn't know, but Ella was definitely still alive. Ella, stay still. I'm going to call you an ambulance. Lane went to the wall phone and picked up the receiver. She dialed 911. On the other end, it rang and kept on ringing. Lane knew it was a small town, but surely there were enough people to staff the emergency service phone lines. She hung up and dialed again. The same thing happened. On the floor, Ella groaned. The sound of it chilled Lane and she didn't know why. Desperate, Lane dialed 911 again for the last time. Ella was going to die if she didn't get an ambulance. Behind her, Ella groaned again. Lane heard movement and turned from the phone. Ella was trying to get up. How was that even possible? Her insides, what was left of them, were hanging on the outside and there was no way she should even be alive, let alone able to stand. But there she was using the table as support while she got unsteadily to her feet. Ella, you need to lie back down. Lane almost puked as the remains of Ella's intestines stood out of her stomach and splattered wetly to the floor. <laughs> Undeterred, Ella started to walk towards Lane, squishing her guts into the floor and soaking her fuzzy slippers in blood and gore. This wasn't happening. It just wasn't happening. Lane thought she must be dreaming. <laughs> Any minute she'd wake up, she just had to wait it out. Vanilla lunged at her with a snarl. <laughs> You're welcome, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> That's horrifying. <laughs> I, kept, I kept picturing your face when I was reading that. <laughs> She's not going to like it. <laughs> But I'm freaked the hell out. So apparently, right. Thank you. There is some kissing. There is some kissing between twins, <laughs> or is there zombie kissing? <laughs> no, I, even I wouldn't go that far. No, there's it's, just, it's between live human beings. So it's and I do want to have faith that like there's a happy ending. I'm sure you won't give it away, but wow, yeah, it's all it's all right. No, <laughs> no pressure. <clears throat> We will move on, but I'm sure people will have some fascinating questions for you when we get around to that. <laughs> hmm. 
Uh, next stop, we have the lovely Jane Colvin. Jane, I will uh, invite you to the to unmute yourself and introduce both yourself as as well as the book that you're going to be reading from. Hopefully, yeah. We'll I mean, that was awful chance. because that was uh, like the most amazing kiss scene, and where you can feel them not wanting to call it a night, and then like the most disgustingly gory thing ever, but like in a good way, right? It was like just gross and awful. But I'm gonna read, um, I, don't, I don't know what I'm reading. It's from my book, there it is, The Holiday Detour. Uh, it's just gonna be so anticlimactic now. <laughs> um, my book is about someone whose car breaks down as they're driving to see their grandmother on uh, Christmas Eve. Um, and it, at this scene, then, then they get picked up by someone who's really lovely and hijinks ensue. It's a mad, crazy night, like all kinds of unbelievable things happen to them. Uh, and of course they fall in love. So I just spoiled the ending, but it's a romance <laughs> that you need that anyway. <laughs> um, so at this moment, the car has just died and Dana, who is the narrator, is trying to figure out what to do. Uh, it took me a few seconds of sitting behind the wheel while cars whizzed past me at 70 miles an hour to snap out of my shock. Then I took a deep breath and gathered my thoughts. The most important thing was to get out of the way of traffic before someone accidentally sideswiped me or killed us both. I tried the key in the ignition once more, but it was pointless. I briefly thought about getting out and pushing, but that would pose a much greater safety risk than leaving the car where it was. No, I needed professional help. I fumbled around for my phone. I had to unbuckle my seatbelt and lean across the console, feet coming off the ground to peek under the passenger seat. I spied its hot pink case tucked against the metal track used to adjust the seat, grabbed it and righted myself. The screen had some crumbs from God knows what on it, which I blew off. For good measure, I rubbed the screen on my jeans. New problem, the phone wasn't charged. I hadn't charged it the night before because I am a total screw up. I'd assumed it wouldn't be a problem because I could charge it while driving, but obviously that wasn't gonna work now. There was a whopping 4% left to the battery and I was going to use it. Before I attempted to dial, I scrounged in the glove box for the little folder in which I kept the insurance information. Once I'd located the number for roadside assistance, I dialed. I managed to get someone on the phone and tell them which highway I was on, but I didn't know where I was exactly. I was fumbling with the map app to figure out where the little blue dot was when the battery finally died right in the middle of my phone call for help. Well, this was a promising start to the day tapped my forehead against the steering wheel a few times, contemplating what would happen if I got out and tried to walk. How far would I have to go in the cold before I found a store or a gas station? I remembered when there used to be payphones in public places and wondered why we'd been so quick to give them up. My next thoughts were about Nana, who wouldn't worry if I were an hour or so behind schedule, but who could have her own emergency and no way to reach me. I couldn't sit in the car all day. No, I'd have to venture out in the cold and hope for the best. I bundled myself up, climbed out, flattening against the driver's side door as a semi-truck came roaring by. Those off-ramps to highways never looked very steep or very long to me when I was driving them, but on foot it took me a really long time to get to the bottom. I was only wearing Converse high tops, and so my feet were soaking wet with snow slush. At the intersection, I slid on a patch of ice and landed hard on my bum. Everything hurt, my pride most of all but I managed to push myself onto all fours and then back to standing. This sucks. Tried to sniffle up the snot that was running down my upper lip. A beat up blue truck honked from the other side of the street. The driver rolled the window down and someone with floppy brown chin length hair leaned out. Are you okay? Was I okay? Not in the least. I was most definitely not okay. From the little I could see of the person leaning out the truck window, I thought she was a woman, though with the haircut and the voice, it wasn't totally clear. She had giant brown eyes, a gorgeous elfish type, and she didn't match the truck at all. Do you need me to take you to the gas station? I waited for a car to pass through the intersection and then ran across the street with my hands warming in my pockets, trying not to think about how dorky I must have looked. I slowly approached the truck, feeling nervous and trying not to do that awkward shy smile thing I usually did when I found someone attractive. Um, what? Best first line ever, Dana. What are you doing walking around the highway? Did you run out of gas? I shrugged and drip, wiped my dripping nose with a gloved hand. 
my car died and then my phone died. I hadn't realized it until I tried to talk, but my mouth had frozen. The words came out in an indiscriminate slur. Did you just fall on your butt? What? No. Up close, the driver looked like a woman. She had the smooth skin and delicate features of a woman anyway. She patted the truck door. Hop in, I'll take you to the gas station. I can walk just fine, she rolled her eyes. I'm not a serial killer. Serial killer wouldn't admit to being a serial killer. See yourself, gas station's two miles back that way. She jerked her thumb in the direction from which she'd come. She started to roll the window up. Okay, take me. I cringed, hearing how desperate I sounded. Take me, I'm yours, take me, I need it. I just met this person and she was already hearing my sex screams. Um, could you, would you mind taking me to the gas station in your, in your truck? I can take you. I couldn't blush in the cold, but I made some weird gasping sound like a donkey. I tried to cover by la coughing loudly. <laughs> my asthma, I lied. I'd really appreciate a ride because the cold air isn't good for my asthma. Well, then don't just stand there. Get in. Not anticlimactic at all. Um, <laughs> charming. And I think you convey sort of the horror of like a bad day that goes to worse because we didn't make the right decisions. <laughs> I know that too well. Resonates painfully, yes, for sure. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Jane. Uh, and then next up, we have Anne Laughlin. Anne, uh, do you want to introduce yourself and let us know what you're going to be reading from? Sure. I'm Anne Laughlin. I write crime fiction. So I've written six or seven for Bold Strokes books, all standalones. And I'll read today from Money Creek, which is my new release. And um, all, all you need to know about it, this is from the beginning, toward the beginning of the book. And you just need to know that, that the protagonist, whose name is Claire, is an active addict. She's addicted to prescription pills and um, she clearly has a problem with them. And um, this, is, this takes place early in the book. Um, oh, and the day before she had quit her job just shy of getting fired. So her, her life was, is starting to become a mess. Okay. The last time Claire woke up with a stranger, she swore it would never happen again. But here she was opening her eyes to a room she'd never seen before. She lay on her side, naked in a four poster bed as a familiar gut clenching remorse made her stomach tumble. Her breathing became shallow and rapid. She didn't dare turn to see what kind of man she'd gone home with. It was still dark out and only the glare of the street light poking through the window blinds lit the room. It smelled faintly of eucalyptus, very tidy except for the pile of clothes strewn near the door. Next to the bed was an antique table and a Tiffany style lamp, a pile of books stacked high. She skimmed the titles. What a man read could tell her a lot. There were the most recent releases from Margaret Atwood, Zadie Smith, and Emma Donahue, contemporary fiction by women authors. Maybe she'd hit the jackpot and hooked up with a well-read feminist man. She turned to her right and found, instead, a woman leaning on one elbow, gazing at her. She had clear eyes, auburn hair hanging loose around her shoulders, and a crooked smile. Her face was handsome, with chiseled cheekbones and a slightly patrician air. Claire grabbed the sheet and pulled it up to her chest. Good morning, Claire, she said in a timber rich alto. Claire stared at her with fixed eyes. Hearing her name made her feel more vulnerable. The woman had the advantage over her. Claire knew nothing and she knew everything. She prayed she hadn't done anything mortifying. It was a good sign the woman was smiling at her. Whatever she did couldn't have been too bad. She broke her gaze and lowered her eyes. Good morning, she said, her throat froggy from sleep and God knows what else. You seem uncomfortable. Claire forced herself to look at her. I'm a little nervous. I've never been with a woman before. So you said last night, I hope it was a good experience for you. She hoped so too. She wasn't upset at having sex with a woman, something she knew would have happened sooner or later, but she was ashamed she didn't remember meeting her or anything that came after that. Her short-term memory had been on the fritz. When she was in a blackout, 
she forgot everything almost as soon as it happened, which was why drunks so often repeated themselves. At least that's what she'd read in a depressing article on alcoholism. She scooched up to lean against the headboard and winced at the hammering in her head. She was beginning to feel the full strength of her hangover. How are you feeling, the woman said. She now sat in a lotus position facing her. Claire avoided her eyes. She seemed entirely out of her league. Not so bad yourself. I'm surprisingly good given how drunk we were last night, she said, but I have no regrets. She reached over for Claire's hand and held it gently. I hope you don't. Can you regret something you can't remember? No, it was lovely. She looked on the floor for her cell phone. It was nowhere in sight. Do you happen to know what time it is? The woman turned toward her nightstand. It's six, still time for more sleep. She ducked her head to meet Claire's eyes, unless she were interested in doing something else. Her voice was sultry, as if she really desired her, which Claire found impossible to believe. No, I mean, I didn't realize it was so late. I've got to go. She swung her legs to the side of the bed. Six is late. I have to get into the office. I work in a sweatshop. Why was she lying? She remembered she didn't have to go to work, that she'd quit the day before, but she was desperate to get away. She looked to where her clothes were scattered near the door. Apparently they'd been in quite a hurry to get them off. I thought you were a lawyer. I am, and the hours are ridiculous. Claire took a breath before she slid off the bed and tried to walk in a reasonably dignified manner across the room to her clothes. She could feel the woman's eyes on her. You're beautiful, you know that, don't you? No, she didn't. Surely her outside looked as bad as her inside felt, the toxic brew of nausea, the hammering head, and a bucket full of recrimination. Her business suit lay crumpled on the floor and she pulled it on before glancing back at the woman. She'd gotten out of bed and stood naked in front of her, as comfortable as a hand in a glove. She was at least six feet, a few inches taller than Claire, and a hundred times more confident. Whatever actually happened, she hoped she'd given the woman pleasure. Usually her blackouts erase the memory of behavior she'd rather forget, but she would have liked remembering her first time with a woman, would like to know whether it was everything she suspected it to be. Claire had to clear her throat to talk. Sorry, I have to run. I'll let myself out. Wait, the woman came closer. Her nakedness seemed billboard sized. You seem skittish. There's no pressure around what happened last night, two adults and all that. Sure, I understand. It's just I have to get going. She stared at Claire for a moment before leading her out of the bedroom to the front door. She seemed ready to move on herself. She held the door open, unconcerned at who might pass in the hallway. The name's Ellen, by the way. I know you don't remember. I do remember. Of course I do. Ellen raised one eyebrow. Are you lying to me or to yourself? She smiled and motioned Claire out the door. Take care of yourself, Claire. And done. That was fantastic. And of course, now I'm confused because I don't know if this is a love interest or like the murderer. Like, ah. I, I'm, I'm hooked. You, you people are going to get me hooked on folks outside of romance, which is pretty much my my genre of choice. Mm -hmm. um, lovely. Thank you all. Um, I too will be reading today. Um, I'm going to be reading from my current release. Um, which is Twice Shy, um, available exclusively from both books, books and Audible. Currently, it will be available everywhere on Tuesday. Um, and Twice Shy is the story of um, a baker, um, a woman who owns her own bakery, Amanda, who falls for the architect that she hires to expand um, her business, but not before she has an ill-advised affair with her ex-wife. Um, the scene I'm going to be reading from is actually Quinn with her architect um, after they had sort of their first official date. <clears throat> From the moment she opened the passenger door for Amanda to the moment she pulled into Amanda's driveway, all Quinn could do was think about Quinn kissing her. Not whether or not she wanted to. No, the want was coming in pretty loud and clear. The problem was, for as many dates as she'd been on in the last year, she was rusty at this part. She wasn't the most take-charge person to begin with. Not that she couldn't take charge when the moment called for it, she just preferred being cautious to screwing up. But sometimes being too cautious was the screw up. I had a nice time, Amanda tucked a piece of hair behind her ear. I did too. 
Quinn stood there feeling as nervous as a teenager and hoping to God it wasn't evident on her face. Does this mean I get to make you dinner again? The tiny gift of encouragement did wonders to calm Quinn's racing mind. Her pulse was another matter, but that wasn't necessarily a bad thing. I don't think I'll ever say no to a meal with you. You cooking it would be an extra layer of awesome. Extra layer of awesome? Where the hell did that come from? Amanda smirked slightly, but didn't seem put off by the cheesiness of the line. Something tells me you're easy to impress. Nah, I just know what I like. Not the best line, but it made up for extra layer of awesome, at least a little. Good to know, Amanda nodded. So she trailed off, but didn't make any move to go inside or even unlock the door. Funny how so much could be conveyed with so little. The smirk vanished and Amanda's lips parted slightly. If the so was encouragement, that definitely counted as invitation. Quinn leaned in, pausing just enough to give Amanda an out if she wanted it. Instead of backing away, she mirrored the gesture, making the distance between them even smaller. Barely an inch separated their mouths now. The smell of Amanda's perfume invaded her senses and addled her brain. But even through the haze, the wanting remained. So different from the haphazard brush of lips the last time. It would be silly to say she'd forgotten what it felt like, but in a way she had. To be reminded, to remember, standing in the porch light with this beautiful and interesting woman felt a bit like magic. She pressed her lips to Amanda's, softly at first, gently. She wanted to give herself a moment to acclimate as much as she wanted to give back to Amanda. But then Amanda sighed, a sound so soft, it's already racing pulse skittering, and she was done. She brought a hand to Amanda's neck, let her finger slide into Amanda's hair. It was thick and soft and made her want to wrap herself up in it. Amanda grasped Quinn's arm, her grip stronger than Quinn would have guessed. The idea of Amanda being stronger than she looked made her smile. She slid her other hand to the smile of Amanda's back and pulled her closer. Not that there was much space left between them, but the shift brought their entire bodies together. Amanda's breasts pressing into her made her entire body hum. For someone on the fence about going in for a kiss, she was awfully close to asking for a whole lot more. The realization pierced through the haze in her mind and made her pull back. Amanda's eyes fluttered open. I think we should do that again. Quinn merely nodded. The kiss was more purposeful this time, less of a question and hotter. The slide of Amanda's tongue against hers cranked up the heat factor tenfold. It went on and on, making Quinn think vaguely she could would kiss Amanda for hours, with or without something more. Not that she wasn't already thinking about more. When they finally stopped, she felt lightheaded and out of breath. She hoped it wasn't just her. Amanda didn't let go of her arm. Definitely a good sign. She tried to fill her lungs with oxygen to steady herself. Wow. Amanda smiled. Yeah. I really hope we can do this again. Amanda's eyes already dark with desire, danced with humor. Dinner or making out on my front porch. So without intending to, we sort of had a nice little uh, alternation of the romance and the uh, intriguing, creepy, scary, uh, which is always kind of fun. I like, I like sort of getting that mix and, and getting thrown out of maybe our normal reading habits and patterns. Um, we have a few minutes left. And so um, I invite people who have questions for the panel as a whole or for a specific author to post them in the Q&A box. Um, our first question actually came in a minute ago uh, from Anne, who is not a fan of horror. It terrifies her, me too, Anne. But after that reading, I am now super curious, can a person be bitten by a zombie and live? And if you turn into a zombie, is there a cure? Are lesbians immune to zombies? So many questions. So <laughs> are there like, are there like kind of, like in romance, there are some tried and true rules, right? You, if you're gonna write a romance, you have to do certain things or your readers are gonna mute, like they won't accept it. Are there some tried and true rules of zombies? Um, I think, yeah, so you don't wanna mess with the whole zombie trope too much. You know, you get bitten, you become a zombie. You know, you get your head caved in as a zombie and you die. So I've, I've sort of tried to stick with, with a lot of that. You look so you basically yeah. become a zombie or you die. Like those are your only options. Well, I think so. In my book, you, you become a zombie regardless of how badly bitten you are, as evidence from my reading. <laughs> and can you can you kill zombies? Yeah, 
you have to you have to like yeah so basically you have to like sever their brain stem i believe so you, like, okay. just, just like cave, like, cave their heads in, smash their heads in i feel like i learned something new every day there you go see <laughs> okay. well on the subject of research uh i'm gonna throw one out to all of our panelists uh what is something you learned while writing your current release we didn't prep questions ahead of time so uh my take folks does anybody have something like off the top of their head? i uh yeah i for the for money creek which is set in a small town i decided to do research by just picking a town uh, from a map of downstate illinois on like a real map and um i drove to that town and spent two days and it turned out to be the perfect location for the setting of my book. So, you know, I just drove around, got the geography and the, the feel for what uh, small town living was like and that kind of research I love to do real hands on. Yeah, it is, it is kind of fun. It's that mix of like the, the sort of real with sort of taking whatever liberties feel kind of right in the moment. That, right. Jay, did you uh, learn anything in, in researching your detour? Uh, actually, the story takes place on the highway between Cleveland and the northern Chicago suburbs. And I have lived all, or it's, so it's like the bottom curve of Lake Michigan. Um, and I have lived all along that bottom curve. And I have driven that stretch of highway probably thousands of times. So I don't live there now, but it was like a really fun, it wasn't research so much as like fun rediscovery of stuff and memories that I've already had for me. Well, that's fun. Trips down memory lane are always kind of delightful. And I'm always a fan of like taking something familiar and maybe making a slightly more charming or more welcoming <laughs> version of it than might actually be real life. Yeah, I never had, I mean, I did actually have my car break down on that highway once, which probably was the impetus for this book, but no like hot person rescued me and we definitely never ended up together. So I kind of wish that had happened. That would have been, that would have been good research. Right. It wouldn't be nice to have that, our own happily ever afters informing our stories. What about you, Chris? I had to, in my story, uh, there's a missing child. So I had to kind of figure out what happens when a child goes missing. You know, it's obviously different than a 24 hour adult um, uh, cry out, but I had to learn like who really shows up, especially in a small town, who do you contact? You know, are there dogs involved? You know, who, who, do, you, who do you call, you know? And so, you know, here I'm just writing it along like, oh, I'll just call the neighboring sheriff. And it's like, no, you have to like the FBI gets involved and like all these different special teams come out and try to help. Um, so it, that, that was probably the most in-depth as far as, you know, any sort of research for this book that I had to do was trying to figure out what happens, what's the actual protocol for when a child goes missing. And is that different protocol if there's a zombie apocalypse? Right, exactly. Then I'll refer to Eden on that one and she'll let me know. <laughs> um, Again, audience, if you have questions for our authors, please drop them in the Q&A box. Um, I will ask another, um, since we have a few minutes, uh, we'll kind of jump to this one because I like to, to get a sense of uh, what everyone is working on right now. Um, what can we expect from you, maybe in the near future, um, as well as, as looking ahead? Um, and why don't we start with you? Sure. <clears throat> I'm... Um... Uh, just heading in towards the, the end of the first draft of a new, um, what may be a series, I've not written a series before, but my character in this book is a Chicago private investigator. So she's, she's series, she has the fundamentals for a series character. Um, and in, in this book, she and her, um, she has an investigator working with her are uh, involved in some corporate espionage involving the formulas for some pharmaceuticals. So they get involved in that in their search for um, the killer of my character's best friend. And um, so yeah, it has to do with the nasty, the nasty wealthy family um, and, and Nell and Corey going up against them. That's, it's hard to describe in short time, yeah. Yeah, but it 
sounds definitely intriguing. I like, I think mysteries are so like recurring characters and kind of all their ins and outs can be so fun and in ways that are sometimes harder to do in kind of a romance art. Mm -hmm. sure. Chris, what about you? Um, right now I'm finishing up my first erotica romance uh, by Britt Ryder. Um, it's called Not Guilty. So I should be getting that to Ashley here soon. Um, as far as what's coming out next, uh, the fourth of my sensory series, Scent, is coming out in January. Lots of fun stuff brewing. Sounds yeah. exciting. Uh, Jane? Yeah. Uh, so the in the piece that I just read, you know, the, the narrator was sort of trying to figure out the gender of the person rescuing her based on these sort of visual markers. And it turns out that Charlie, the the other main character is non-binary. Um, and my next book comes out in April. It's called The Queen Has a Cold. It's a royal romance. Um, and it also has a non-binary character who's also intersex. Um, so it kind of is like the, the bizarre question of like, how do you handle inheritance laws um, when someone isn't either a prince or a princess is sort of the central question that comes out in April. That sounds really, really fascinating. Um, I, we definitely don't have enough non-binary uh, leads in the story, so I think that's super exciting. And as someone who's a fan of Nell Stark's princess uh, books, um, I, think a, I think royalty can always be fun and exciting. Uh, that's awesome, thanks, Jane. And last but not least, Eden, what horrifying things are you cooking up for? <laughs> well. So I just saw one of the comments before. I think I'm going to start a band. Um, someone came up with a name already. Was it <laughs> Zombie and the Smashing Heads? <laughs> so that's me. <laughs> no, I'm working on um, a book called uh, Quiet Village, which is about um, a woman and her niece who moved to a little village in England. And uh, there's something watching them from the shrubbery. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just be a nice quiet village where people have pleasant no no <laughs> no nothing nice is going to happen maybe some more zombies uh, further down the road i don't know we'll see you know you seem to like really mix it up there's all yeah. the horrifying supernatural things you know you're not yeah. no i don't i don't like to typecast myself you know i like to <laughs> <laughs> um couple of questions coming in in the Q&A. Uh, it's uh, one question is came from uh, Chris's comment about um, researching child abduction. Uh, wanting to know if BSB has a, a contact number that uh, people can call uh, if we need to verify that our, our research and our internet search history is in fact <laughs> legitimate and that we are writers. I don't think we actually have that, although that might be a great new responsibility for Paula Tai, who was our sort of BSB attorney on call. Um, but we've got, a, we've got quite a few uh, lawyers between editors and authors um, at BSB. So um, I think we could probably wrangle some, some retainers along the way. Um, this is a good one. Uh, do you know when you are starting to write a book, whether it's gonna be a standalone or a series? And is it always the same? I mean, I'll answer first, which is that when I, I wrote the Cape and romance series, I did not intend it to be a series. I wrote my very first book, Winter's Harbor. And then I just kind of wanted an excuse to write more books set in Provincetown because I love Provincetown because it's not infested with zombies. <laughs> Lovely. I've not encountered any zombies, at least in my group up there. Um, it's always sort of been built. Um, although in retrospect, I sort of wish I had, I think it, you can create more cohesion if you sort of sort of decide. Um, other people who are done series or are thinking about series, what do you think it's essential to decide ahead of time that that's what it's going to be? I, I don't know if it's essential because I think some great series have started without knowing that they were going to be series. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned, I, I've written only standalone and I, I knew that at the beginning of each book. The current book I'm considering doing as a series, but I didn't do what I would advise somebody to do. And that's to think through the first, you know, two or three books in the series so that you can produce some story arcs that, that span the book. And I, I don't know why, but I've gotten almost all the way through this book without 
giving that any consideration whatsoever. Um, so I'll have to see what, what I can salvage. But I, I, particularly when it comes to the love story that's attached to a detective or other mystery protagonist, um, you know, if you have them get together with somebody in the first book, is that anticlimactic then because there's not gonna be any romance in the subsequent books. The romance isn't as important, but I always like to have it. And um, so that, I think that might be one of the fundamental questions you have to answer. What's their love like gonna be like? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I think that makes, that makes a ton of sense. Um, we are almost out of time, so I'm going to sort of do the rounds very quickly. If people want to get in touch with you, what's the best and easiest way to find you? Chris Bryant. Uh, I would probably say on Twitter. I'm pretty active on Twitter at Chris Bryant 2014 um, or on Facebook. Um, either find me or Molly on Facebook. I'm, I'll be able to reach you that way. Uh, Jane. Jane.colvin at gmail.com. You can email me. I don't get enough email. Uh, <laughs> I would love email. I'm just going to put you in charge of my day job inbox. So. <laughs> don't uh, yeah. me. I'm going to give my email as well. It's Annie, A N N I E, 3310 at gmail.com. I love hearing from people. Excellent. Eden? Uh, probably like Facebook. You can email me if you want. EdenDarry at gmail.com. <laughs> it's up to you. Whatever you feel like, really. Facebook. We're, we're we love hearing from readers. So that is yeah. definitely here. I am I'm on uh, Facebook and Instagram, probably more than anything else. Um, Aurora Ray writes, I think it's both. Aurora.ray on Instagram. I'm asked that question, but I'm terrible at answering it. <laughs> Um, we are just about out of time, so I would like to take a moment to thank um, all of our panelists for participating and reading from their stories. They all sound fantastic, and I look forward to reading them. Thank you to everyone in our audience who attended this afternoon, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all soon. Have a happy day, everyone. Right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.